Okay, hello, hola, bienvenidos. Uh, I'm Susana Tumpkin, one of the curators at El Museo del Barrio. I'm very happy to be here this morning with Cristina Fernandez, one of our Dialogos um, artist participants, who is showing in this year's Dialogos with Gallery Luis Sosi in Los Angeles. So thanks for joining me, Cristina. Oh, good to be here. <laughs> yes, and you are in Los Angeles. I'm in New York, so this is a coastal to coastal <laughs> <laughs> meeting. I'm just going to read a quick introduction, and then we'll just launch right into um, talking about your work and, and what you're working on during quarantine. I know you're teaching. Um, so Christina Fernandez is a Mexican-American artist based in L.A., uh, her largely photographic practice addresses her identity, her family, labor, and gender issues. Um, and she is a professor and the department chair at Cerritos College in, Nor in Norwalk. So thank you for joining us again, Christina. And I don't know if you want to just start this by uh, telling us a little bit about yourself and about your career. Sure. Um, so I'm a native Angelino. Um, I grew up uh, born and raised, you know, in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, my parents were uh, Chicano activists and raised me on the picket line, basically. <laughs> um, so instead of going to, you know, parties, birthday parties on on the weekend, I was on a picket line or some protest march or in Delano with the United Farm Workers or wow. something like that. So that's how I grew up and both uh, me and my brothers grew up that way. And, and um, you know, it was a, a very, I think a very good upbringing because it um, trained my eye on things that were uh, unjust, um, things that I felt like needed fixing. And when I became an artist, um, that's sort of where I trained my practice, right, and, and the subject matter of my work. So uh, it's, you know, although I missed out on some childhood, you know, things, um, uh, I didn't miss out on becoming like a person that um, cared about others, had empathy, uh, understood where I come from, um, you know, so it was good. And how did you, I mean, I feel like so much of what, at least of what I know of your work is um, phot photography based. How right. did you sort of move into that field? I went to uh, PCC and transferred to UCLA and I had been taking uh, painting and drawing classes and, you know, I tried to petition out of the photography class. I didn't think I would be interested. It wasn't my thing. And they wouldn't let me. The counselor said, no, you need photography. To be an artist now, you need photography. Mind you, this was, you know, the 80s. So, yeah. um, so all right, <laughs> I have to take photography. And I ended up taking it initially with um, Joining Manis, who was Robert Heineken's wife and an incredible educator, a beautiful person. Um, so we had these one-on-one -on -one meetings that kind of was her way of teaching was very personal one-on-one -on -one meetings. Then you go and work and then you bring back the work. Mm -hmm. You didn't have like big critiques or anything like that. And um, she looked at my photographs, you know, with her loop, you know, <laughs> um, and she said, can you go get the rest of your work? I said, well, some of it I can't get because it's sculpture. <laughs> but yeah, I was, I was in class with George Herms. I was taking sculpture with George Herms and producing yeah. these really large sculptures. And so I went up and got what I had that was print, that was 2D and brought it down. And after she sort of inspected it, she said, well, she said, well, welcome. And I was like, what, what do you mean? She says, you're one of us. Wow. <laughs> like that exclusive yeah. you know, artist club. You know? <laughs> and so that was really, I mean, I'm still getting a little bit of chill there because she confirmed for me what I had always, always known, you know, sometimes mm -hmm you need that confirmation from somebody who is actually in the world of art, you know. I wanted to start with your Levanderia series because I think, I mean, you already mentioned you're a native uh, Angelino and I think the city is very present in a lot of your work. Um, I also thought this work is interesting not only because these, this imagery is very familiar to us in New York, 
um, yeah. where, you know, a lot of us also have to go to the laundromat to get our, our, our clothing clean. But also because um, this work was shown at El Museo del Barrio in, I believe, 2010 as part of the Phantom Sightings. Yeah. Mission. So I have an image of the installation of that, which we can turn to in a minute or so. Um, oh, you know, I didn't go, so it's going to be great. Oh, great. Excellent. Well, so maybe, I don't know if you want to, uh, I'm trying to advance to the next slide, if you want to tell us a bit about these pieces. So the Lavanderia series came out of um, sort of a larger project that I was doing in which um, I was photographing the streets of um, East LA, Boyle Heights area, um, setting up my four by five camera and photographing at night because um, there was a lot of neon uh, being used in the in the windows. And so I liked that. It really attracted me, the rich color, the strange kind of glow that it gave combined with the street lights. There was all these sort of color twists, right? Because I was working with film. And um, so I was photographing um, storefronts from this, from the sidewalk. And I came across a uh, laundromat, and that would be La Vanderia number one, that had all these sort of um, drippy looking tags on it. I loved the way that it looked. It looked beautiful because of, it was sort of a frosted look. Um, you, know, you could partially see the light through it, but it also felt like a little violent as well because of the drips. So I, I liked that tension that was created. And what I found out later was that this was um, etching liquid that was being used by taggers. So they would get the, a paintbrush and actually use a light uh, etching liquid to tag the windows. And it wasn't something that you could erase. You would have to replace the entire window pane. Um, so that meant that I could go back <laughs> and photograph the storefront if I didn't like what I got. So with four by five photography, you know, you have to take the sheet film and get it developed and then you can look at it and then, oh, well, I didn't shoot it quite right, you know, and then I could go back and photograph it and it would virtually be the same. I mean, the window would be the same because nobody's going to replace <laughs> an entire storefront of windows as, you know, sometimes they did, but in this case they didn't. And so I decided on this, I, you know, I had been photographing them at oblique angles from further away with the sidewalk showing, but I decided on this kind of view um, for the series. So it's very sort of architectural. It has the rule of thirds. You know, it has all these strong vertical and horizontal lines mm -hmm. that provided a framework, I felt, for everything that was organic that was happening inside the laundromat. The, the people moving from one place to another, creating a blur, because these um, uh, exposures were long. They were long exposures. And so um, I used that, that first laundromat, uh, number one, as sort of the key to the rest of the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's lots of laundromats in, in East LA. So I went further out into um, Montebello, Pico Rivera area as well. I'm gonna bring us to the installation because I, I wanted to ask you a bit about the installation of these pieces. Do you like to present them in a grid structure, in a line, like here we see them at El Museo in um, the 2010 exhibition, as I mentioned earlier. So oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so now you can finally okay. get a glimpse of the of the show. <laughs> beautiful and powerful, right next to Ken Gonzalez Day. Yeah, who was actually a Dialogos artist last year. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah. Um, no, this is how they're displayed. They're displayed in a line with a very um, you know pronounced black matte frame um, behind um, plexiglass, basically. Mm -hmm. So it creates another sort of barrier to the image. Um, because I really thought like the, the windows in La Vanderia were so, sort of this kind of membrane that you could see through but not see through. And they were defined by the graffiti and the framing structure, right? So I'm there, but I'm not there as the photographer. You know, I'm, um, I'm, I'm observing, but I'm not inside, I'm outside. 
Well, on that note, um, I wanted to talk about your piece, Untitled Farm Worker, which I was, I was so excited to see that you were thinking about um, representing what was a uh, multimedia installation work. So I think, I'm trying to think of the genesis of this piece. So Cesar Chavez had gone on a hunger strike and my parents had been in the, you know, 70s uh, UFW, um, uh, uh, you know, activists. They had, you know, we were always in Delano. They were always involved in some way in the, in the United Farm Workers. So I was looking at some literature that the UFW put out and it basically chronicled um, deaths, injuries, illnesses um, uh, of farm workers, usually due to pesticide, but not always. Pesticide, um, labor disputes, you know, people would get beat up on the picket line, um, actual sabotage and tampering with people's cars, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, I need to do a work about this, uh, but I don't, I'm not sure how to do it. So what I did was just type all the information on these little three by five index cards. And I, um, in the sort of room that we use for Chris Burns class, it was used for performances and installations. And each um, student would have it at least twice during the semester or a quarter actually. And uh, I brought a bunch of dirt into the room. I can't even remember how I did it. I piled it in my old Mercedes that I had. I had a vintage Mercedes and just stacked that car with dirt, you know, with bags of dirt. And I brought it into the room and I planted the cards as a performance piece. So when I got into CalArts for graduate school, I thought I wanna, that piece was just exhibited once for class, that's it. Mm -hmm. so I want to translate it. I was in uh, CalArts as a photo major, or uh, you know, an art major with a photo em emphasis, basically. And so I uh, decided to reproduce it photographically. So these are five by seven um, photographic images of the three by five index cards being put into soil by my brother. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, it's interesting that for the photograph, you wanted to have the hands literally planting it instead of just showing the card itself in the piece. Let me, I'll go to a detail as we're talking about this. It animated the image because his hand would be different every time and the tilt of the card would be different. And so although on first view, they all, all look very similar, mm -hmm. that 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 slight difference animates the image mm -hmm. and i wanted to have a similar feeling to the installation in that you could actually you know um, feel it alive in a lot of ways because this is about death and injury yeah so uh it was arranged in a grid pattern and i presented it that way as a grid pattern it was not very well received at all why do you think it was not well received? I have no idea. I mean, except for the fact that maybe they weren't used to um, looking at work like this. Mm -hmm. And one of the comments was, well, you've put us in a horrible position because if we question your facts, we look like terrible people. Interesting. That quote. And one of the other uh, one of the other young women in the class said, you know, I grew up on a farm and we would eat apples right off the tree and none of us have cancer. <laughs> Crazy. People are really looking at it from, well, maybe different places of privilege, privilege I suppose. Oh, most definitely. And, yeah. you know, the teacher, I won't name names, but the teacher who was in charge of this critique in, in this class, just sat back with her arms folded against the wall. We would sit along the wall, right? There was no like chairs or classroom. Yeah. And um, she would just, she just sat back with her arms folded and just let it all happen. I guess it was my, you know, test. It was my first crit. Trial by fire. Yeah. Yeah. So I, but I put it away. I put this piece away. So why, um, 
why were you thinking then that now is the moment to uh, represent it as a multimedia installation? I, I've been wanting to do it for a few years now. Um, just was struggling really with a photographic representation mm -hmm. or a sculptural representation. The sculptural representation of the dirt in rows um, is difficult, you know, difficult to manage. I'm not known as a sculptor. Um, so that struggling with how to present it. Um, and also, uh, you know, I need, I, I wanted to reconnect with this information as well, because now, you know, the problem is, it's not just pesticides and, and, um, you know, uh, just, you know, the basic stuff of being a farm worker and, and resulting injuries. And, and, and exhaustion, but it's heat stroke now because of global warming. Well, we'll look forward to seeing it recreated um, hopefully soon. Yes. <laughs> um, well, from here, I wanted to go to uh, another installation, maybe move to uh, this most recent uh, body of work that was going to be shown, or that is shown in Dialogos 2020. Um, oops, I need to change. Uh, which are, it's view from here, this series of windows. Um, I should say they're interiors looking out through a window. Yeah. Um, and I mean, right now I'm sitting in front of a window. I know a lot of us are <laughs> looking out at the world through our windows right now. So. I mean, they're, they're so <laughs> prescient of our current moment. Um, and yeah. You from here is a lot about going back to the basics of like ways of thinking about photography mm -hmm. and how photography is a window, you know, um, that we can see through. And, and a lot of these views uh, from here, images, you, the outside is obscured through less depth of field. Um, and the photographic frame is, actually the frame of the window. Mm -hmm. So sort of reiterating the idea of the photograph as a window onto the world, but then blocking it in some way or pointing out that that fails at times uh, through this less depth of field effect and how you cannot see clearly um, out to the world. You know? mm -hmm. So that's kind of what this the series is about. Uh, right now, we're looking at um, an image called Laura for Laura Aguilar. Um, and, uh, you know, she died, I think, about two think years ago. Two now. Years, yeah. yeah. And um, her and I were not close. We were exhibited together at times. Um, she was my first contact um, in terms of like, uh, you know, I would go work at this Los Angeles dark room and she worked there, you know, and I would burn out the bulbs frequent, frequently <laughs> because I was doing these really dense photograms. <laughs> She's like, Christina, you know, it's not meant for that. I'm like, I know. And she wouldn't give me another bulb. You know? <laughs> um, but um, very much respected her and her work and she was all, always gracious towards me did not treat me in any way as a competitor mm -hmm. which i have to say did happen with other uh, artists mm -hmm. in the chicano community so um when she died i happened to know um somebody that was in charge that's been in charge of the imagery and you know packaging it trying to um get it into museum collections um and she's been very successful at doing that fortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know, I know her. I've known her for a very long time. Uh, and so I asked, I said, do you think that uh, Laura's heir would be okay with me going into the home and photographing? And so they had some rules about what could be photographed. But then when I sent them the other work that I'd already done, they were like, oh yeah, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. You know? So this is the view from Laura's bedroom window. And um, I basically, took the view as if I were sitting in her bed wow. from that point of view um, because I wanted to 
um, give the viewer what she would have seen mm -hmm. from the angle that she would have seen it. Um, so that's kind of the making of this. Um, and, you know, Laura lived in a kind of a, what would I call it, a bungalow, like mm -hmm. almost like a classroom bungalow yeah. with a lot of windows. So I had many, many windows to use. Yeah. I, chose, I was a little bit torn between this one and the an other one that actually viewed into her backyard in which you could see the structure that she had a dark room in. Oh, wow. So um, I, I went back and forth, back and forth between, should I use the one from her bedroom or the one with the dark room view? And I ultimately chose this one. Because I do feel like, you know, I do feel like I needed to make a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, although there is one part of the series, I, be, I believe it's uh, Yerksa Cabot's imagery that I chose two windows because, um, well, there's like something like 150 windows in the Adobe structure wow. we built. So um, one window yeah. wouldn't be adequate to um, represent him. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, obviously, um the the artist Laura Laura Aguilar was so I thought amazing to see this piece, but the diffusion of the light, the curtains, even the bundle of the fabric, um, which I think resonates with her own work, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yes. it's such an incredible image. Okay. I think I do have Cabot as maybe the last piece for us to discuss. If you, I mean, can you tell us more about how you select? um the people that i mean i don't know do you consider these portraits or i do consider them portraits the vertical framing was something i you know uh, in in my edit eventually decided on because i wanted to be these to be representative of portraits mm -hmm. because what we're looking at as uh you know it's the view from inside the structure that they lived in mm -hmm. And so imagining, you know, what they would be looking at, but also cutting that visibility off because, you know, these photographs of representation of a historical figure will never suffice, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm literalizing that process with, um, with aperture basically. Um, so these, like going back to my initial thinking about these images is, or this series is that it's, I'm really going back to the fundamentals of photography and just working so trying to work with that somehow mm -hmm. without the use of text or layering although they're still layered <laughs> yeah yeah definitely <laughs> um yeah i can't seem to get away from that but um yeah so cabot yerksa um was an artist a musician <clears throat> a writer who um, lived by himself out in Desert Hot Springs and created an adobe structure of three different levels with something like 150 windows. And the windows were to create something called a venturi effect, where the air would flow at certain times of the day and cool the structure and then would be let out at certain times of the day. So he would open and close these windows during the hottest days in order to cool the building. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was a lot of windows <laughs> and it's, you know, a, a, a historical structure. So, you know, a lot of times I would just kind of um, research the area that I was traveling to or specifically travel to the area in order to access the structure. Mm -hmm. So these and are virtually taken on, on tours of the structures. That was really interesting for me to learn that that work was born out of the structures. Um, looking at it and thinking about it, I was really thinking so much about the people more than the structures, but um, I don't know if this is an, a transition we can make, but again, as we're sort of within our own homes and our own structures, I wanted to ask you about, you know, again, I know you're still teaching through this <laughs> moment of quarantine, and I don't know if you're working on any particular um, artwork or thinking about your own um, practice right now as we're sort of in this imposed, uh, imposed yeah. moment? <laughs> I am um, using the time to get organized. As I mentioned earlier in the interview, 
I had took it, taken a, t a ten year hiatus, and this is kind of slowly getting back to work. And during that ten year hi hiatus, everything was sort of packed away. I mean, I, I just could not um, handle being a mother, an artist, and an educator. It was I, one of it. One of it had to drop. You know, when it had to take a back seat, mm -hmm. and that was being an artist, you know. Um, although I still created work, I created a series when my child was a, a toddler called Sereno, um, which was taken on our neighborhood walks. So I had to really fully kind of incorporate being a mother and being able to photograph with a more portable camera and with more accessible landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so the the quarantine is definitely you know my practice is outside i am not i don't do much in this i don't do almost anything in the studio i'm not a studio photographer my practice is outside i mean i've always thought of myself as a landscape photographer i mean, although the end product is not necessarily landscape yeah I, I, i'm out and i'm photographing and right now there's a lot of prohibitions on that so I'm taking the time to really go through my archive. As I mentioned, there's, you know, going to be a survey in 2022. Um, you know, we're going way back. <laughs> uh, Cecilia Fajardo Hill is also doing something for the Phoenix Art Museum, which I've had to, you know, pull the boxes out and um, <laughs> really look at some of the really, you know, very early on performance work that I did, performance for camera work. So um, that's what I'm doing. I'm spending my time sort of re-looking at the things that I had created, you know, one series after another, after another, and after another. Well, I wanted to thank you so much. I'm going to just end our recording. Okay. <laughs>